and we may have a fascinating conversation about the use of artificial intelligence and bioelectrics to direct how cells grow and into tissues and organs. Uh, with us are Marco Rolandi, Associate Professor of Electrical Engineering, Marcia um, Teodorescu, Associate Professor of Computer Engineering, and Marcella Gomez, Assistant Professor of Applied Mathematics. Before we get started, I, I have to uh, announce a slight change to our program. Alexander Wolf, the Dean of the Baskin School of Engineering, isn't able to join us uh, this evening, uh, but here to give us some insights in the School of Engineering and tell us more about our guests is Marco Rolandi, the Associate Professor of Electrical Engineering. Please welcome, Marco. Thank you, George, for the kind introduction. And uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. I'm really excited. We usually don't get so many people come to class. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Alex couldn't be here today, so he asked me to share a few, a few news from Baskin School of Engineering. Uh, you probably heard, if you follow the news, that UC Santa Cruz as a whole was in, included in the American Association of Universities. It's a big deal. Like, we're now peers with uh, Princeton, Harvard, you know, Stanford, Berkeley, and all the other top tier universities. And we couldn't have done it without the students, the alumni, of course, and the parents of the current students and our faculty. Uh, of course, Baskin School of Engineering actually played a big role in this. Uh, our program has grown 300% in the past 10 years. That's 30% per year. My stock portfolio doesn't do that, I can guarantee you. <laughs> our students will grow 30% every year. That's what we're gonna work for uh, through our, our careers. We're gonna make sure their opportunities are grow, gonna grow 30%. Now, some of the opportunities that students have with us is really about research. We are research in intensive university, and we receive funding from many places to actually perform world-class research, which is done with postdocs and graduate students, but we really make sure our undergraduate students can work with us. One example is a recent grant from NIH to work on the Human Pangenome Pen Genome Reference Sequence Project, is a sequencing uh, um, sort of grant, and the idea behind it is to try to understand the DNA of every single person. So then I, one day every person is going to know their DNA, is going to understand how they can cure the disease or whether they have troubles in the future so they can actually prevent that. Uh, recently, we also had some really important funding from the uh, Intelligence Advanced Research Project. This project is called PASCAL, and this project is cybersecurity. Again, another really important and contemporary topic. I mean, with our, our words being interconnected pretty much anywhere, cybersecurity is essential to our daily lives, not just to engineers, but to everybody. So this is another really important part. And, uh, and uh, recently also, uh, there's some really important data that we have as far as our impact beyond the students. Uh, we're at the Baskin School of Engineering, what we do, we really make sure that our research is contemporary, is applied, and can go directly to the market. 65% uh, of the patent portfolio from UC Santa Cruz was from the Baskin School of Engineering. And we take these patents, and we're able to, with these patents, to actually start companies. We have two incubators. One is the start of Sandbox in Santa Cruz, and one is right here in this building, Silicon Valley Link. Uh, so these are the kind of the things that we do in Basket School Engineering. And today you're going to learn a little bit more. This is a project between myself, Mark Orlandi, uh, Professor Gomez, uh, Marcella. She's an assistant professor in applied math, and Mircea Teodoresco, who's an associate professor. Now, Mircea and I are in the same department. It turns out we took electrical engineering, computer engineering, put them together, because together we're stronger, and now we have an electrical and computer engineering department. So before we get into this sort of like, uh, the, the nitty-gritty details, I uh, was asked to introduce you a little bit about the problem. Like, I saw the title, and I saw the abstract, despite the fact that I wrote it, it's a bit of a mouthful, <laughs> uh, I have to admit. So, so maybe let's, let's see if I can, we can you know, look at this from a different perspective. So I'm sure all of you have heard of, of uh, organ transplants, right? Organ transplant is one of the biggest feats in medicine of this century, perhaps the past century. And uh, they're, they're amazing, right? Because if, for example, if my wife is a nephrologist, she always tells me, like, make sure your kidneys work well. Because if your kidneys stop working, then like, you have to go through dialysis. It's very helpful, but it's also not a particularly good quality of life. If one is able to get a transplant at that point, then like, you know, it can recoup quality of life and have, be a happy and productive member of society. Now, unfortunately, there are not many organs. Now, that is bad if you're waiting for an organ, but it's also good if you're a prospective donor, because organs come when people unfortunately pass. So I say it's good that there aren't very many organs around, 
How do we fix that problem? So that's the engineering problem that we had. And you, you think, is this not medicine? Is this not biology? Well, it's bigger than that. It's really like something that you have to take many people from many parts and put them together. So the idea is, is as follows. Uh, you probably heard of stem cells. These are cells that are undifferentiated in that they're happy cells that can be whoever they want, right? They're like your, you know, for the parents, they're like your kids in freshman here, right? They go to college, they're like, what are we gonna do? Um, and so they, the problem, like your kids, what happens is that like, if you wanna make an organ out of it, you need to poke them a little bit, like, oh, you're going the wrong direction, go back. You know, you need to turn into this, into that. And that's what we do, uh, because we don't know exactly what to tell them, uh, but what we know is that like, let's say we wanna make a kidney, we wanna make the shape of a kidney, how do we take a group of cells and make them into the shape of a kidney? And it's a very difficult problem, and the way we do it, we use some stimuli from our electronic devices, but because we don't know exactly what to tell them, the beauty of it is that we use artificial intelligence from Marcella Gomez to actually figure out this black box problem so that we can make an organ. Uh, so with that, we'd like to first introduce Marcella. She can tell us a little bit about her work, and I'll Mircha also can sit down and sit down as well. <laughs> but we have to swap places. I think we have to swap places. Sorry. <laughs> we were told the position is very important. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think because there are some target shooters with tomatoes yes. out there. Yes, and they want yes, to make yes, sure yes. they get They the want right to get Mark on me. So. Mm -hmm. So I've started. Yep. <laughs> um, so in, in general, I like to think about biological systems and how we can engineer, engineer them um, to direct cellular response. So how can we get biology to do what we want it to do? And more importantly, can we make biology do better than nature? We know that nature has its fragilities and it has its strengths um, and really want to use artificial intelligence and machine learning in order to counter out, counteract the fragilities of biology. And so, did you want to talk to about stem cells? Um, sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it, one of the challenges of biology is that there are very complex biological systems that, with a lot of um, a lot of states, that are uh, nonlinear mappings and they're highly interconnected. And so, it's really hard to model these systems. We cannot realistically come up with a mechanistic model for stem cells, but we can, through machine learning methods, understand how uh, the cells might respond to changes in its, in, in its external environment. And so as we, as we modify and change the external environment and monitor and observe the cellular response, we can learn this mapping and in that way then direct the cells in any behavior that we might wish in the future. And so that is my role in the project. Um, so Mircha, you haven't discussed yet. Yes, role. so um, yeah, uh, um, I have the most complicated name, I guess. Uh, but not the most complicated task. Mm -hmm. uh, so the way I see it is this. Um, yes, Marco and I are right now in the same department, but we have slightly different hats. So uh, while Marco is uh, somehow a physicist at the heart, I'm supposed to be the machine builder. So the way I see it is that the physics and the phenomena and exactly the way people are talking to the same cells, it's part of Marco's group. Uh, the control and uh, artificial intelligence is done by Marcella, but at the end of the day, uh, everything should come together into some sort of device, I would say, which is a very glorified sort of band-aid that uh, we are hoping that this is going to be stuck on some wound and uh, it's going to, so that's going to be my task. So uh, there are electronics inside, there are uh, little channels which are delivering drugs and dyes and other things, and there are optics inside. So that some optical system is going to measure how the cells are doing, and this information will be given to Marcella's uh, program, and that one is going to uh, tell us what type of drugs we are going to do, and that is going to be given to Marcos uh, PhD students, which are building already, uh, by that point, they are going to have a very nice uh, delivery uh, device. So everything is very small. Technology these days is uh, cheap and nice, and uh, things that uh, I would have never dreamed when I was much younger, when I was a student in school, now are uh, totally achievable. So in a nutshell, this is what I'm doing. Great. So, so perhaps at this point, they like, okay, this is an interesting project. It's somewhat randomized. It was, <laughs> I can guarantee you the random introduction was intentional. Uh, mm -hmm. we, the, the question is how do you, you know, you might be curious to know how do we actually came up with this, right? How do we get together? 
And uh, if you indulge with me for a few minutes, I can tell you the story behind this particular project. It's that always didn't a story. necessarily <laughs> start simply like, okay, this is an engineering problem. How do we find the people? Um, so I moved to UC Santa Cruz about four years ago now uh, from the University of Washington. And uh, I've been organizing a conference in bioelectronics at Azilomar, which is a wonderful campground by, by the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And it's a wonderful place to have a conference because after the talks, one can sit down around the the fire pit, you know, have a few beverages and, you know, discuss various things. And uh, at this conference one year, I was sitting around with a good friend of mine. His name is Chris Bettinger. He's from, uh, from Carnegie Mellon. And, uh, and Ad Ernesto Adriano Rotondo is one of the editors of Cell Systems. Now, Cell Systems is a biological journal. And we were simply chatting about where is the future of bioelectronics. Uh, bioelectronics, broadly put, you can think of it as, uh, as uh, a way to stimulate biological system with electrical signals. Sounds very complicated, but we have the typical example is a pacemaker. A heart pacemaker is something that every you know, second or so gives a low jolt to the heart to make sure that the heart is at pace. And it's what it is is a, a, a small battery with a circuit inside that oscillates, so every second or so gives a low signal and tells the heart to go at that particular pace. Now, what we do in research, we look at ways to use this kind of principle beyond the pacemaker, right? Uh, there's ways now to do stimulations of the brain, there's ways to do stimulation of other organs. And what, we're, uh, what I was talking about with my these two colleagues is uh, like, what is the next step, right? Uh, once we, what can we do beyond organs, right? What can we do beyond, uh, beyond simply taking something that's already made and then just stimulating? And so I started talking to Ernesto, who's an editor, a journal editor, so in science, after we do our research, we usually publish in a journal, so it's good to make friends with <laughs> editors. And, uh, and eventually, after you know, a few months, I came up with this idea, so I emailed me, him, I was like, hey, Ernesto, listen, um, I have an idea for, for a perspective, which is kind of like a forward-looking paper, and uh, I would like to associate the idea of controlling a biological system, like telling cells what to do, each one of them, using a very sophisticated pacemaker. And I think there's enough literature out there as such that we can make a review, discuss the ideas, and then show how this convergence can happen. Uh, and the editor said, oh, this is great. This is fantastic. I think you should do it tomorrow. <laughs> now, you know, a month goes by, a few months go by, uh, a year goes by, and the nurse team is like, hey, Marco, where's your review? I was like, I don't know. I don't see any. I don't know what to do. And I have to say, I know nothing about stem cells. I know <laughs> nothing about cells. I am an, I'm an electrical and computer engineer, so I make circuits. So after about a year and a half, finally I was like, okay, I got to do something about this. So I turned into the solution of the 21st century, which is Google. Um, <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I need to find the faculty. So I put UCSC synthetic biology, which is what I was discussing about. And fortunately, Professor Gomez here shows up. <laughs> um, this was, I think, Marcella was in her maybe first year at UC Santa Cruz. And uh, she gets this email from a random professor, be like, hey, do you want to write the paper together? Um, fortunately, first year professors are very much like freshmen. They're like, they're happy, they're full of potential. <laughs> uh, and so they can do a lot of stuff. And uh, she agreed to work with me. And so then we started working together on this project and we received some funding and we started working with a collaborator in Boston as well, and then, you know, we met Mircha, uh, because at one point it was like, okay, I have these amazing things that can talk to a single cell, right? Think of a very small needle that can poke a cell and, like, tell it what to do. Marcella had this amazing algorithm that <laughs> just kind of, like, can decide what the cell is going to do and tell them exactly what to do, but we are missing the link. We're missing, like, how is this little tiny thing going to connect to a computer where the algorithm run, and that's where Mircha came into, into play with that. Uh, so that's, that's how this project came about, and, and now we're, gonna, we <coughs> have a, we're working with a large group of graduate students and postdocs on it. So that's, that's the story of the project, but maybe we should go a little bit into more depth. It's and amazing. Uh, I, didn't, uh, right. so, uh, I think we all started pretty much in the same time. I started in 2016, pretty much. I think so, yeah. yeah. So, well, she started in 2017. Right. Okay. Um, so anyway, so this is a little bit strange because I'm moderating as well as, as, well as, as, well as answering questions. Um, 
If you haven't realized by now, I like to talk a lot, so you're going to be here for quite a while. Uh, we like to talk too, but we like to do uh, it. So <laughs> but anyway, so the, the I guess like I was going to go into a little bit more depth with Marcella, uh, specifically because I know artificial intelligence is a hot topic, and I'm not an artificial intelligence expert. I'm a user, uh, which, which uh, makes Marcella extremely precious for, mm -hmm. for our work. Uh, so when it comes to artificial intelligence, what do you think is the biggest, well, what is artificial intelligence, if you will? How would you define it? And what do you think is the biggest strength when it comes down to this particular project? It's uh, a difficult question. <laughs> uh, artificial intelligence is a really broad term, obviously, and it, it encompasses machine learning. And a lot of the methods used in artificial intelligence are mostly s statistical based, very data driven, uh, very data hungry. And one of the biggest challenges in applying, um, say, the you know, or in broad terms, machine learning or artificial intelligence to biology, is really that we don't have that amounts of data. I mean, this isn't Google X where we have tens and thousands of images to train on to learn facial recognition, right? This is something where uh, we are have a fluorescent micros fluorescent microscope taking images of a cell on one observable state in this highly connected network of who knows hundreds of states, right? And we don't really understand the mechanism by which, which it works. And the sampling time is, um, I'll say is safely every three minutes so we don't kill the cells. Um, so it's not a lot of time points, not a lot of data. Uh, we have nothing to train offline on. Uh, everything has to be learned in real time. So that's one of the challenges. Uh, we don't have a model, a priori. Uh, so <laughs> it just all keeps building one thing on top of another on top of another. Um, and so, you, you know, I, I think that the work that I do is broadly under the umbrella of machine learning, but I would say it, it's also largely influenced by my background in control theory. Um, and so in control theory, uh, one of the more um, well-known ex examples is flight control. Uh, and this uses a, a field of control called adaptive control, um, in which that, in which the uh, assumptions are minimized. In that, when you're on a plane, you really don't you really don't know um, you can't foresee disturbances that might come up, right? So you may have a model for your engine and how flight dynamics work, right? But if an engine were to fail, a component of the plane were to fail, if um, there suddenly was turbulence. Um, how would your plane? How would your dynamics adapt to those disturbances and those uncertainties? And I and then I had this idea to think about us thinking about cells the same way. There's all these things that we don't understand, and all these perturbations, uncertainties, changes in the environment that there's no way we could spend 20 years trying to understand and predict and model, but it would never happen. And so, really, the only way was to really think about the similar approach in which we think about flight control, and that is the adaptive control. Um, and, and really the machine learning methods come in, the way we think about how we, uh, in real time, as we, as we gather information about input and output response of the cells, how do we update uh, the parameters in our, in our model and our control scheme in order to continuously learn and adapt. So even if that cell were done to change its model, I mean, oftentimes you could, um, cells have this thing where they change phenotype. Uh, they, they may behave, you could spend, people, and people do this, researchers do this, right? They'll spend 10 years understanding, you know, one pathway of the cell and how it works, right? Uh, and all of a sudden, there's a phenotypic change because there's some delective pressure, maybe an antibiotic, maybe it's stress, and all of a sudden, the cellular behavior, ch behavior changes because some pathways shut down and other ones activate. And yeah, you got to spend another 10 years building a new model, right? And that doesn't make any sense. So we need something that is continuously adapting and evolving with the cell as well. Um, so there, there's a trade-off because when uh, people like to shy away from, from these non-mechanistic models, what we call data-driven models, because like, there's a purist that are like, no, we, it won't give us any fundamental understanding. Um, we don't know why it's happening. Um, and then the really pure data-driven people are like, it doesn't matter, it works. You know, that's like the engineering side. Um, but, uh, but really, we want to be able to find a way to strike a balance between these two, and, and I do think it's possible. And, um, and, uh, and I think that, and that the answer in that is kind of trying to keep these, these uh, machine learning methods as, as simplistic as we can. Um, for example, our machine learning method is, is we don't have a deep 
multi-layer deep learning algorithm going on because we just don't have the data to train such a network. So, and we're just talking about like one hidden layer network really that we're working with. And this allows us to um, be effective and predictive in our control and also um, help us understand a little bit about what the, what the cell is quote unquote thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So, so, you know, Marcel, when, uh, when uh, you talked about flight control, right, and you talked about machine learning in cells, uh, before starting to talk to Marcel, all I knew about machine, machine learning was like the images of kittens or dogs on the internet, right? Um, can, you, can you maybe make an example on what we are doing, like, uh, with, the, with the cells, uh, using that, the same kind of, like, analogy where, like, you know, we, do we recognize something and then we tell them what to do, like, mm -hmm. uh, can you go into more specifics there? Mm -hmm. So in control theory, what we need is we need sensors and actuators, anybody who knows anything about control theory, right? And we need a way to observe the world and a, and a way to impose our actions on the world. And so that's kind of where we connect. And you talked a little bit about this, mm -hmm. but maybe I can elaborate yeah. a little bit more. Um, and so the, um, the actuation comes from the bioelectronic devices and um, and the observations come from the fluorescence microscopy and a lot of the hard work, the hardware and the interfaces come from, from, um, from Mirsch's work. And, um, but so in the fluorescence, in, in, this, in this specific setup, I guess you want me to speak about the specific Well, I was just thinking setup. like, how, how do you recognize if a cell is doing what you want it to, to do? Uh, so, so we, it is like I, I mentioned before, it's a, it's a single layer, um, single layer or single hidden layer, right? So it's a, a radial basis function. So essentially, imagine that you just have a black box and that's really what you start with, a black box, right? You, you stimulate it in some way and it responds in some way. You have no idea what's in the black box, but all you see is what I put into the environment and what comes out. So and, and in our case, so just so that you guys can have something tangible, is we have a fluorescent reporter, a green fluorescent reporter. Um, and it correlates with memory potential. So um, if the memory potential increases, then this fluorescence uh, decreases. And if it decreases, then it increases. And so this is, this is our readout. This is our, um, our sensor, right? And then, and then we have an actuator in which um, we can apply volta differential voltages to pairs of electrodes and release or deliver ions. And this influences the uh, memory potential, thereby influencing this fluorescent readout, right? Uh, and so, in, so we really need to, so we have this, this uh, single hidden layer network of these, they're called radial basis functions. And what it says is that in theory, essentially that if, if, you're, if you have a, a big enough set of functions, it can approximate any nonlinear mapping. So it can essentially map any input to any output. And if you have enough data, it'll essentially learn your system in, in, in uh, completion, right? So it, it can predict, it can control. And so, uh, and so that's essentially what this, what this is doing, is that it's, it, there's these um, radio basis functions with these given weights, and they're combined in all these nonlinear ways. Am I getting too technical? And then <laughs> I, I, I wasn't I'm, sure I'm how technical lost, you wanted me to go. I'm sure they're not. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but it, it, it's it's just a it's a black box and 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 in reality it's just this combination of nonlinear functions and and the uh, and the way that and they just learn how to combine each other essentially in order to accurate, accurately represent the input to output mapping of these cells and I fear fear that right. I may be cool. losing people so <laughs> yeah, uh, question what kind of cells are you using uh, they're stem cells. These are human stem cell lines. Yes. That's you can make them from skin. We, we, we actually don't know because some of the work is done at Tufts University. Oh, okay. and, and, uh, and I. No, they actually. Do, so it, this is better than that, in that we actually have a device in Boston okay. and okay. our researcher here, okay. and we actually can communicate through the internet what the device is going to do uh, and, and then, you know, beam it back in real time. And so then, then we can stay here when it's 82 degrees in the sun <laughs> instead of <laughs> being in Boston where there's like, you know, 20 degrees right now. Um, so we, we couldn't do the work by ourselves. We needed a collaborator that is. Single cells. You're working with single cell, cell layers, single cells. It's at the a resolution of the imaging is at the single cell layer. Okay. So you grow a single cell and then um, 
they want a confluent layer, so it's a kind of a sheet of cells that are wall to wall. And you stimulate the whole thing. And the, yeah, and so they're sitting on top of this bioelectronic device. Oh. And, um, and so essentially what we're doing is we're manipulating the environment of the cell. Um, and the, the algorithm, because it learns, when I do this, the cell does that. And when I do that, the cell does that. I want the cell to do this specific action or have this specific fluorescence response. Then because I already learned the behavior, then I know how to stimulate the cell to get that output. Yeah. So you, so you have a monolayer. I'm biology. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. You have a monolayer of stem cells. Uh-huh. Yeah, the extracellular environment. Okay. That's right. So it either becomes more ionic or less ionic. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You made it sound like you didn't have a model for this, but if you're going, for example, creating an artificial kidney or repairing mm -hmm. skin damage, you have to have an end state. And I'm just thinking broadly that there have to be a lot of intermediate steps. So you, are you really going to grope your way to the end state, or do you have a model you just understated how much Oh, that's something we've been thinking about in a, actually a, 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 a new project so we've, for the projected future um, because that's, that's a different question. So we have a controller, which once you know where you need to get to, the controller gets you there, right? That's, you have a reference that you need to follow. Like uh, the airplane, you, you have a trajectory from point A to point B. Um, controller gets you there. The problem is how do you, how do you know what the right trajectory is, right? And I think that's kind of what your question is. And so um, that's, that's a separate problem, which we need to understand what the reference trajectory is. What, what is the biological process involved in, in the inter intermediate stages to get us to the final stage? Are you doing this Edison style? Like every filament in the world to find the light bulb? No, no, no. No, so you can also use machine learning yeah. methods to kind of zero in on, um, uh, on the right trajectory. But uh, sorry. I'm going to interrupt a little yeah. bit. We're live streaming and filming this talk, so the questions from the audience oh. can't be heard on our live stream. So we're going to bring mics out, and so if you do have something that you want to pop a question to the panel, um, we usually do that during our Q&A at the end of the talk, but mm -hmm. this is a good dynamic conversation going, mm -hmm. so we'd like to facilitate it for everyone. So if you can wait with your question until we can bring you a mic, okay. that would be fantastic. And now you can carry on. Okay. <laughs> and so... Uh, the, the, the question, okay, so then the, for the organs, um, a lot of it's like a, sp it's a spatial thing, right? We know what, once we know how to get from a stem cell to say the specific cell type that we need for that organ, um, then it's taking it to that and then also just making sure that it's differentiating in the right place and at the right time. So then there's other components, there's spatial and temporal components as well. Um. Uh, but well, we're going to wait for a mic. There's a mic coming. Th yes. Then uh, I think Mircha is getting fidgety, so we're going to talk I'm about fine, this I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Um, I'm not fidgety. Is it this one? Uh, yeah, this gentleman there. Rather than grab stem cells that are naive and instruct them to build a kidney or build a liver or build another organ, why aren't you looking at, by the way, I don't know if this is working. Yeah, there it is. Ah. <laughs> Why not look at stem cells that are already in the kidney or in the organ that you're looking at to see if you can use those stem cells to create and build a new organ? Mm -hmm. I, I, can, I mean, I think that's a different challenge. Um, yeah, I, I see your point, but then you would have to start off with the stem cell that's already differentiated into that cell type. Um, but I, I think, I think because part of it is you know this engineering part, and another part is just also um, understanding the fundamentals of biology, which we don't fully understand. And oftentimes, when we try and different, you know, when we uh, people who work in stem cell differentiation, they find ways to externally. Um, to change the external environment such that they get a specific cell type, right? Uh, and, and I don't mean ionic. I mean like um, like certain inducers that will induce certain pathways that are known in the in in the cell. But at the same time, we're also trying to understand how cells are inf inform themselves and inform each other without some um, buddy in a lab bench putting in some signaling molecule saying now become 
a liver cell now become an organ cell. And I, I think that the, the value in this is just really the versatility of it, that we don't need necessarily need to find that specific uh, cell type to start with. Um, but, but once you have that cell type, then obviously going from that to an organ, like you said, is, is a different problem and kind of where your starting point would be to get where we need to get. Um, if, if, if the audience doesn't mind, can we carry on and then we can maybe yeah. ask the other questions to later? Um, so, so Marcella mentioned a couple of times the ionic environment and I wanted just to describe for a couple of minutes how do we do that and then like, you know, pass it to Mircha because there's a lot of challenges between the ionic environment and the cell and what Marcella is doing which are really fundamental and so, and so I think it's important to talk about it as well. Uh, so when I describe the pacemaker, what the pacemaker does, it basically gives a little jolt of electricity to the heart and that sort of like makes it pulse, right? If anybody has ever touched a battery or got electrocuted, you know, you know, you get a little bit of muscle spasm, right? Which is not pleasant. The, the pacemaker does it much more delicately. Now, there is, there, is a, there is a challenge there, which is uh, we are made about 67% of water. Okay, I'm sure you heard that before. You have to drink lots of water because you're made of water. Um, if any of you remembers those, some experience you may have done in high school, if you take a battery, you put two wires into a cup of water and the water is distilled, you actually, the, the light bulb doesn't turn on. Okay? Water is not an electronic conductor. Uh, it just doesn't conduce electricity. Now, in a metal wire, the electricity is carried by electrons that move around in the metal wire, and then they reach water, basically, in the cup, and if there's nothing else in the cup, then, then the water doesn't conduct electricity. Now, our bodies don't just have water, we have electrolytes, you know, that's why Gatorade is so important. <laughs> um, and, and so there's lots of ions that are charged, and so move along the water, as if there were electrons, they move the charge from one place to the other, and electricity is actually the movement of charges for a given amount of time. The challenge is that if you start off with the metal wire, and then you move to ions, oh yeah, ions are salt, and so they move at different speeds, and you not necessarily know which which ion you're moving, okay? One could move sodium, one could move potassium, one could move chloride. And what happens in our bodies, each one of the ions has a specific language. It's like speaking three different languages, right? Sodium does one thing, potassium does another thing, and chloride does another thing. So what my group started doing, this was qu quite a, almost a decade ago, is actually creating devices that are able to move ions instead of electrons. So the idea, we have basically a salt field reservoir we can control this by delivering, say we have a solution with sodium chloride, that's a simple example, that table salt, right? Now instead of only delivering sodium chloride together, we can decide, okay, we're gonna deliver only sodium for a little bit, only chloride for a little bit, and then see how the cells sort of uh, react uh, using Marcella's argument. Now, the description is, you know, this is simp you know, simply described and done, right? The trick, as, as Mircea mentioned, is once you have these devices, how do you make them control uh, with, with the computer, right? How do you put these things together? You, you know, you have something that is mainly made out of water, you know, our cells, and then you have a computer. Now, when we spill a cup of water on your computer, you know, it doesn't work. Uh, and not for very long anyways. And, and so this is where Mircha comes in and, uh, and he sort of like makes this uh, sort of interface. And my question for Mircha is, is like, what do you think is the biggest challenge at the interface? Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, first of all, yeah, uh, in so many ways I see myself uh, someone in the middle. So on one hand we have the fundamental physics, on the other side we have the fundamental mathematics. And here I am uh, trying to build a device that deliver the type of data that Marcella needs from the type of uh, physics that Marco needs. And at the end of the day, uh, you see, our body has the great ability of defending against things. So uh, once you are putting a pacemaker, now that we are you using the equivalent of a pacemaker, I'm not sure if you uh, know, but uh, the good ones are going through the arteries. So they are sending it, God knows from where, I forgot where, but they're entering through the artery. Why? And they're kind of dangling in the middle of it. Because if you are putting something really close to the body, the body is going to create some sort of boundary and is going to build it up. 
is good sometimes, but from our uh, electronics is a disaster because uh, we are uh, trying to talk to the body. And at the end of the day, to do the fluorescence that um, Marcella described, for all intended purposes, uh, imagine that we are stripping a camera from your iPhone and uh, that little CMOS device has to come close to the cells, immediately it start gum up and things, and it's not going to work. It turns out that as, as the science actually has a problem in this uh, field. Uh, we know how the solid state works, we know to some degree how the biology works. Actually, we don't have a clue exactly the interface between solid state and biology. That's a field which is, we are actually trying to apply for more money for other grants exactly to understand you know, what happens at the interface between sensing devices and biology. How is the camera, for example, in my case, going to last for a little while and data which is going to be uh, sent to Marcella will uh, actually not be destroyed by, as I said, all this build up. So there is noise in the system and she has to take care of it. <laughs> and, uh, but the problem is that my goal is to either make this noise as small as possible or find out together a way of minimizing this noise in the, uh, understanding. As long as you understand the problem, it's you are halfway through. Um, and uh, now, Yes, so there, there, there are several stages. I think you asked a question regarding uh, how, uh, why don't we use uh, the cells straight from the kidneys, for example, or liver. Uh, probably one, one way of looking at that is uh, there are different stages. At this point in time, we are trying to understand the fundamentals, the physics, the biology, all the real things. So it's all happening on a pet tradition called Boston. Uh, the biology is in Boston, and uh, our students love it actually to go to Boston. We send them all the time because they're, you, you, you see, they have concerts <laughs> and they have music, and things are happening in Boston when you're a student. Uh, so, but at, the, you're, but at the end of the day, yes, this has to work in a human being which is moving around, and that's even worse than anything else. The devices and all the things that Marco is doing are micrometer size, and we have to keep them in contact with the skin, which actually is growing. I don't know. So that, in a way, yeah, I'm not sure if I uh, ask yeah, more, sure. I, uh, start more questions. But uh, frankly, um, yeah, the physical. So, so I guess there's a problem. couple of other things that come to mind. I think I was chatting. We were chatting about batteries. Oh yeah. Some of the audience, and and you know, batteries are you know whether it's a car or whether it's a new diagnostic device that gets deployed in Africa. Batteries are essential. So Absolutely. how do we power? What's your plan for powering this device? Well, that's one of the biggest problems at this point. Um, I don't know, in many ways we don't know. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, what uh, we are hoping, it's uh, so the pacemaker lasts for uh, quite a long time. My wife had a small implant to measure her. Uh, she turns out to have some arrhythmia that she lived for 40 years with, we, we didn't have a clue about. But now that we learn about it, we freaked out. Uh, so the solution for this is they implanted a tiny little thing, which is that much, and it's, uh, I don't know, five millimeter uh, across, and it's la lasted for three years in her uh, chest, and it's measuring several channels of uh, EEG continuously. So it's amazing how, uh, so the, my question is not so much how are we going to power it, my question is how do we make devices which are using incredibly low uh, power to use uh, okay, already commercially existing type of things. And probably that, that's a thing, there are some incredible leaps of, uh, that happened recently, truly from the game industry, from the cell phone industry. Without cell phones, we would be really stupid. <laughs> and uh, they, uh, when I said a camera from a cell phone, I'm not joking. We have another project. Literally, we are using cell phone cameras to do high-level biology. So we are going to do in this project the first prototype will have cell phone cameras. S so I don't uh, know if Sorry. I don't know if you noticed what happened there, right? I ask him how you're going to power the devices, and he sends it right back to me, be like, oh, we need devices that use up less power. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> what we are doing in university. But Sorry. So, so yeah. the other so the other question I have, you know, there is the power to the devices, right? But as we said, we get this data out to a computer, and then it gets beamed to Boston, or like from Boston to here and back and whatnot. So how do you how do you get the data out of the device? What is, well, what is the strategy there? The strategy is um, Amazon Cloud. Uh, so, or a cloud in general. The so, we the, the device itself the is going to layer. have, um, yeah, the device itself is is going to have. Uh, so, they 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 have um, USB and they have uh, Wi-Fi and things like this, which can uh, totally be sent on the cloud. So, the the theory that we have, and we are using generally, is that 
in our world, the devices shouldn't be smart anymore. So uh, the devices can be as simple as possible, which means the lowest possible amount of uh, power and the lowest possible amount of uh, intelligence, which suddenly means a smaller processor, suddenly means lighter device, suddenly means cheaper to change and everything else. Therefore, everything is being sent to the cloud and all the mathematics and everything can happen in the cloud. So which doesn't matter suddenly that you're in Boston and you're in Santa Cruz. I'm not sure if you noticed that Amazon makes more money from the cloud than makes from um, selling us stuff. I, I, do you, are you sponsored for Amazon? No, I'm is not. That what you're I'm not. About? But <laughs> we we actually it's probably uh, uh, you you know th there are some companies out there which make more money from uh, the cloud and other things. But uh, frankly, uh, yeah, we are you using the Internet of Things. It is actually a thing. It used to be Internet of Things. Used to be. Uh, how do you call a buzzword several years ago? It's not as much of the buzzword now, but actually we are using it all the time. So, uh, 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 answer. The device itself is going to have um, uh, sent everything up there, and all the intelligence can happen there. Therefore, she doesn't have uh, a real limit on uh, mathematics that she can upload. So, so I have one more question for you, so then we can change pace a little bit. Uh, you mentioned brain engineers. I know it's I like didn't. I've I actually didn't. You I did. try not to. I think you did. <laughs> I didn't. So I totally no, didn't. I said I have other projects. It's, it's, uh, anyway, so there's, Mircea is also working on a super exciting project called Brain Engineering. And the reason why I mentioned that because I think it's going to be the subject of another crawl lecture. That's why upcoming. I didn't mention it. That's why he's not <laughs> supposed to talk about it, but maybe you can give it yeah, it's a, like a little thing. teaser. Yes. Yes. About 10 seconds. Yeah, the 10 second uh, teaser is this. We have another uh, parallel project, which uh, some of the uh, student team is also working in uh, that. Uh, uh, project, so which is a collaboration, uh, so we, which is under the umbrella of our Genomic Institute in East Santa Cruz. So uh, we have a lovely place called Genomic Institute, they are very friendly people. And in that one, we are collaborating with uh, faculty in University of California, San Francisco, uh, which are really deep neurobiologists, and we are trying to understand how the brain functions. And in a nutshell, uh, we are uh, people are building uh, little things which are called organoids, unless you haven't heard of that before, probably you haven't. Uh, it's, it's just uh, in some geeky circles, it's a very popular term. Uh, they take several, uh, you take a number of stem cells which are being, co if they are brought in a uh, close proximity in a certain way, they suddenly have the instinct of creating things. So it's in a way parallel, but in a way different than this project. Because in this project, we are trying to specifically tell the cells what to do, and we are trying to uh, help them to differentiate in whatever uh, we are telling them to do, while in the other one we are trying nature to uh, uh, grow itself. And the observation is that w uh, we are so far behind in science, so if we look at each other, we are quite similar, we all, yeah, we have more or less hair, but uh, we are uh, losing it uh, the way my grandfather used to, but uh, the <laughs> point, so that's genetic, so yeah, I'm going to be bald, but uh, I am already. <laughs> But the point of the matter is that we have two eyes, uh, two hands, a few of us have two noses and other things, while these little groups of stem cells are identical uh, clones of each other and they look very different. So you end up with tiny little balls which can replicate kidneys or lungs and so in our case we try to replicate the uh, brain tissue the cortical layer, and there is a huge amount of problem. Come to the next lecture and we'll tell you the problem is that, <laughs> uh, whenever that is going to be done. But in okay. that context, to finish it, is that we have the same problem of interface between uh, sensing and stem cells and giving them um, all sorts of uh, nutrients and other things. So guess what? The same devices will come into the picture and everything is going to be fine. But it's <laughs> different. Yeah. Great, great. <laughs> Um, so the reason why I wanted to ask the question about brain engineers particularly is because I know Alex, if, if you were here, would have, mm -hmm. been, would have been asking this question specifically because he's very passionate about, actually the entire faculty of school engineering, very passionate about the impact of our engineering, right? And that like you, you can have an engineering discovery, but how are you going to use it really is what matters. And it's a new era for engineers. It's not just we make something and then let it run wild and see what happens. Like there's the ethics of it, the importance of the impact on society. Is, is, is really part of our training, as a matter of fact. And actually, I'm happy that Alex is not here because he would have asked mm. me this question, which I think is very hard to answer. But I, I can ask, ask you, Margaret. Um, <laughs> so, so the question is as follows. Right? We're talking about stem cells, control, artificial intelligence, right? You could pretty much okay. create a monster if you wanted to out of this stuff. And what perhaps like each one of us can answer a different way. Uh, maybe I can start with Marcella because she's on my right. <laughs> I'm sure she's happy about this question. Yeah, I mean, that's the scary part about technology. Um, 
it can be used for good and it can be used for evil, yes. <laughs> um, and hopefully we try and direct it towards good. Um, but I, I mean, I, I, you had addressed one of the potential applications was growing organs. And, you know, if you need an organ transplant, then bam, you have an organ, right? right. You grew one in the lab. Um, other things are, so actually one of my, my uh, recent alums, actually my only one, because it's only, I started in 2017. So I had a <laughs> master's student and, uh, and she was from pure mathematics, um, undergrad in Berkeley. And uh, she came to do master's with me. And she's like, I, and, you know, I get this all the time from, from this new generation. And it, it really boggles my mind of people that just want to come and they want to do science that changes the world. Um, and in, in my day, I never thought about that. I mean, I was no, never so conscious of it, I would say, as this new generation is. Um, we'd always just think of like, oh, the beauty of mathematics. And um, we, you know, <laughs> we want to be like Einstein. And, um, but no, but now people come to me, they're like, I want to do something that impacts the world. I want to do something that changes the world. And, and she's vegan and um, towards, you know, she just w wants to do eco-friendly things. And, uh, and I was like, oh, how can, you know, it, I struggle a lot with how can I help her? Um, and so one of the things she works in, actually, she ended up, after working with me for a year, learning about biology, synthetic biology, um, she landed a job in a, in a, a biotech startup called Memphis Meats. Um, and so what they're working on is um, essentially growing, har culturing meat for consumption, right? And so this would have a huge impact on the environment. We wouldn't have to have these, you know, herds of cows and these slaughterhouses and, and all the waste that's produced and all the uh, resources that are that are uh, taking up feeding feeding the cows, right? So uh, that's one example. And, and so the problem there is actually, um, they also deal with stem cell differentiation, right? Because they're trying to differentiate these into, in these, into t the tissue, meat tissues, essentially, right? Um, so that's another example. Uh, Great. Well, I guess it's my turn. Uh, <laughs> I'll answer my own question. Uh, I don't have any alumni yet that work in, in, uh, in sort of like uh, saving the world by creating artificial meats. It's pretty amazing, though. Uh, <laughs> like, I mean, I guess my question, my answer is that it's, it's, it's part of humanity in that, in that like it's been a challenge for humanity throughout the ages, right? Uh, if you think of Frankenstein, for example, the book was written after all these discoveries in bioelectronics came about be because th there were experiments of Galvani. Galvani used to take frog legs and, sh you know, so like uh, show that if you put a battery across a frog leg, the frog legs moves, right? Uh, and obviously people started getting scared of it uh, because it can also be used for, for evil. Uh, I think that the tru truth is that you, we just have all together to work to make sure whichever technology we make is used in the best ways. and. And I am convinced, because I'm an optimist, is that technology has had this amazing impact on society. Unfortunately, a lot of very <laughs> bad things have happened with this technology as well. I like to think that we tend to remember the negative things, the things that go really bad rather than the positive ones. Uh, we take for granted anywhere from like modern robotic medicine to vaccines to antibiotics. These are all amazing things that happen with technologies. Or, you know, computers. Now you can dispatch uh, sort of like if you call 911 in a few seconds, you can dispatch anywhere around. If you have a cell phone, you can be tracked. Those are all things that technology can help us. So uh, I really hope that, you know, for one thing, I guess the good thing about our project that we just started, so it doesn't work. So if you want to use it for evil, <laughs> you know, you're pretty much out of luck. Uh, but, but, you know, maybe in a few years, we're going to find a way for good use for, for using it. And uh, I'll let Mircha answer the question okay. as well. No, I'm laughing. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the way I see it is this. Um, Yes, of course, everything can be uh, used for evil, everything can be used for good. Uh, but you see, we as a society went through this many times, so there was a time when they were just uh, eating fruits and suddenly yeah. someone discovered an arrow and bow and that, that was a moment. Uh, yes, they died, some of them, but they also many managed to kill the woolly mammoths, so now they eat better, there are more humans. Um, so it goes on and on. Uh, so they discover fire, they discover electronics. So yeah, I fully believe that uh, in a I do not know what's going to happen soon. However, we are going through one of these uh, again, in, in which uh, we are one of the groups, one of the uh, many groups which are uh, developing things, which are in the interface of biology and uh, uh, electronics and society and everything else. There are many other groups. Everybody is, is very strange because uh, in some ways these things exist in Star Trek. You see, you stick something on a wound and it grows better and it's suddenly done. So uh, 
And that's all for good, and people in Star Trek live a lot longer than the people right now. <laughs> it's also true that in Star Trek they had a Borg. Uh, now, <laughs> it's a matter of the society, the ethics, and everything else, which we are very careful uh, to uh, go in one direction and not in the other. But I fully believe that the society has a huge amount. I'm, I'm also an optimist, by the way. Uh, so the society has a self-regulating somehow that we managed to went through all of this... Uh, turbulent, uh, I don't know, millions of years, I guess, and uh, we are going to succeed. Through we are not going to be robots, but we are going to be helped by all sorts of robotic devices to still continue to live better and longer. And uh so, so I think that's, you know, live better and longer, I think, is the best way to finish the lecture, despite the fact it's a little bit early. Not to finish, rather, to stop us talking a lot. There were many questions from the audience, so I, I would like to open it up for questions. Uh, and there's going to be microscopes going around. I'm sorry I made you wait for <laughs> so long. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I don't think no. so. Uh, okay. Oh, good. There. Um, I've read uh, recently about people wanting to use a 3D printer to print organs with organic mm -hmm. materials put in the right positions. Is there any connection, do you think, between what you're doing and this? So Mircea can tell you how many 3D printers he owns first. <laughs> I actually don't know. We had this discussion because we had uh, a basement full of them and we are debating how many students can enter that basement because there are too many and they're breaking them. The bottom of the line is that yes, things can be done like this and we do print things not only in plastics, our uh, students have changed them to build all sorts of hydrogels that uh, we learn from Marcos group and we are growing cells through that so theoretically we can do that. And we are trying in other projects to uh, make little veins and grow cells to create things. But I don't think this is what we'd want to do here. So here we want, uh, so we, because the point is this, one is the biological shape and the other one is the functionality. From the point of view of biology, you can have it on a wedding cake. Doesn't mean that that person is going to start walking after that. So you can make it of sugar. Actually, we are using sugar. Yeah. So we are going to print things of sugar. I'm not sure if you know, not is the candy machine that came into the lab, ca <laughs> cotton <Not> candy. Yeah. <laughs> we have uh, cotton candy machines. Uh, it turns out the cotton candy machine can create incredibly quickly, super cheap, $40 on Amazon, uh, really thin <laughs> strands <laughs> of sugar. So what people have done, and it's not us, uh, they embedded them, so they try to create candy machine uh, strands, embed them in hydrogels, and grow uh, uh, cells through that. We have a student which worked on this for a while, but she's not here, and uh, she's probably watching. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that can be done. But in some ways, it's old hat. So we think this is a lot cooler because we start <laughs> from biological things. So those will not really function. They will look like a nose. People, e ears are very popular in uh, this uh, field. But exactly the functionality, it's not the, uh, so by doing the way we are, and, and the, the other thing, they can totally reprogram your skin cells and turn it into stem cells, and then you're going to have your personalized uh, organ eventually made with Marcos uh, methods. So oh. that would be an interesting thing to do in the future. If I can just add Again, you saw it in Star Trek. For, for a second, <laughs> there is a, there are, there's really good work done in printing cells, that is what you refer to, uh, and, uh, and th they're complementary to what we do. And I think ideally in the long term, maybe you can put them together. Right now, yeah. Mitchell is putting polymers, but if we can print the cells and stimulate them, then it's, it's, it could be really amazing. But it's, it's a difficult problem, right? So you need more than one approach to get to it, and it's important that we all work together. Sorry, maybe it's not old hat, it's future work. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Dhaval. I'm coming from the computer science machine learning AI uh, knowledge. So, um, two-part question. One is fundamental. So it looks like what you're doing some fundamental research, right? Where you're taking some control environments and then seeing how certain actions create certain responses. And you're trying to create the data sets for machine learning later also. You're gathering data sets. Uh. We're not creating data sets because it's all real time. The problem is that we're implementing controllers, which sense and respond real time, as in like in between the images we take the image before the next image is taken and decide what action to take. Um, so we're actually learning in real time, um, but y it, it's hard to test the controller on data sets because you need something that will react to the actions of the controller. Okay, got it. Oh. So um, uh, that's great. And um, 
uh, any literature in that context is uh -huh. there any, or exist? It looks like a very fundamental uh, approach to things. So probably there's some uh, reference uh, information in the past where people have tried this mm -hmm. also, right? Because you're trying to study some base. What what makes it possible today versus five years back? What makes it, I mean, it was possible five years back, I would say. I think that it's only relevant now. So it's, I would, because one of the issues is the computation time, right? And so if your application is a drone, I would not use my algorithm because you will not be able to respond quickly enough and you'll end up crashing. And, uh, but the thing is that biology works on such a slow time scale that it works in our favor in which that we can start to think about new methods that are, that may be a little bit more computationally expensive than than methods that we t tend to think about in robotics or autonomous vehicles. Okay, and my second question was, uh, once you figure this out, whatever you folks are planning, uh, what, what are some of the top two, three main applications that this will be used in? Uh, to build organs, is that? Uh, uh, I mean, the, the problem with this is because we, we, we kind of try to project far in the future, right? So we've gone as far as saying like limb regeneration, and that's where we might think about, well, we don't want to take a liver because maybe we need some uh, bone, skin, and cell adjacently you know, produced next to each other and patterned at the same time simultaneously, something like that. Um, uh, I guess the other one was, was for example, the, the Memphis meat example that I had. Um, but I think we're, we're still very much, you know, in that fundamental research stage where really the applications are, say, something 10 years down the line. Um, uh, and it's, it's exciting to think about the prospects. And But like Marco said, probably not something to worry about yet because uh, things, you know, it's like uh, CRISPR Cas. It doesn't, you know, it works in the lab under very careful conditions. But we don't have to all worry about being genetically engineered in the near future, right? So we have two questions from our online audience. Oh. Um, and the first one is um, at the early phase of stem cell differentiation, a stem cell starts from an electrical neutral environment, no other cells to communicate with. So do we believe that? stem cells can respond to electrical signals? We, we hope so, because <laughs> that's what we're trying to do. Um, and uh, this, is, this is, you know, there's, there's a lot of interesting work out there that shows that that is, that is indeed a good, good path to take. Of course, until, you know, the proof is in the pudding and, and until we actually finalize all the experiments and, and get the results. Uh, maybe in three or four years time, if you come yeah. back, you know, we'll tell you all about how it actually worked. Uh, but that is, that is, there's enough theories out there that show that this should happen. And the next question is, how is fluorescence used as a reporter for cell differentiation? And have you succeeded in directing some sort of differentiation? And how are you measuring that differentiation? Are we allowed to talk about that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so we have not reached differentiation yet. Uh, there are special reporters that are, that can tell us right now, so a cell basically is, is a sphere that has a small membrane, right? So there's liquid outside and there's liquid inside. The inside contains all important things, uh, various parts of the cell that make it live. It turns out that there's a potential difference in that across the little membrane of the cell, uh, there is some charge on the outside and some charge on the, on the inside, what that means if one were to put a wire across the membrane, you get a current, okay? That's called membrane potential. And uh, the typical example is that that's how uh, neural, neural signals work, right? There is, there's a neuron, uh, the neuron fires, the membrane potential along the, the neuron changes with time and then it transmits to the next one. Now, right now, what the theory goes that the stem cells have a certain potential and we try to change it because the differentiated cells have a different potential difference. Uh, and, and so th that's, uh, that's what we, tr we try to do. And these fluorescent reporters specifically tell us whether this inside of the cell is a higher or a lower potential, electrical potential energy respect to the outside of the cell. Meaning, is there more charge inside the cell or more charge on the outside? And these specific fluorescent molecules tell us one way or the other. Uh, yeah, I'm curious about uh, what goes on in terms of the uh, liquid interstitial space between the cells, mm -hmm. the, the contacts between the cells, right. and inside the cells, what genes are activated, and have you guys been c comparing what you guys uh, find with the electrical potential and the activity of the cell vis-a-vis -vis what's going on inside the cell and in between the cells? Mm -hmm. 
So our strategy is, uh, so you, pr you probably know there's a, there's a cell, it's got this membrane, and the next part is that there's low channels that let charge move in and out to the cells and chemicals, right? They're called ion channels. Uh, these ion channels respond to different concentrations of salt, ions or salt, outside the cell. So what we can do, we can change the electrostatic environment around the cell, so we can change the amount of salt that is outside the cell, and we know that that changes how the cell behaves inside. Now, our theory is that that is also should affect how the cell is going to differentiate. And there's also some means that we can talk about yet to detect how that happens. Uh, we don't have a proof that that happens yet. We have indication from the literature that that should happen, and that's why we're working on that particular process. But, uh, maybe I could talk more yeah. um, abstractly and um, not, not specific to the project, but. Um, I mean, because one of the issues is, uh, well, I guess we, we know some of the pathways involved in some of the stem cell differentiation routes. And so if we can identify those pathways from previous literature, you can imagine you can put a reporter in and then see which pathways are activated. And that could be an indicator that it might differentiate into that cell type. So we have like, you, you would need multiple um, reporters to read out. We have a list of um Many, many, many. There are 20, 30 types of uh, dyes that are going to uh, uh, eventually be tested to see which one is uh, more informative uh, for the fluorescence of the cell. So the idea is to pump a little bit of that and try to see what happens. But uh, yep. he will kill me if I say more. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, so Just joking. Was, uh, similar to the, the previous one, which is, y you know, we got a previous cow lecture here on, uh, on, on messenger RNA and other mechanisms by which, which genes assert themselves. And I always thought that that was all sorted out until, you know, you guys are really starting with this black box approach. So do you think it is possible that somebody who combines the best of both you know, a little bit of an informed approach and a little bit of a machine learning approach can get to the answer sooner than you guys can. Yeah, oh, definitely. Um, I think the problem is getting that little bit of a, I, I, I mean, we, I've, I've, I've thought about this at least in, in my research group and in starting with um, kind of a part of a model and, may, and then having the, um, a neural network represent the unknown part of the model, right? And definitely in that scenario, any n amount of prior information is always better. And what that means is that you just need less data to, to train and learn uh, an accurate uh, representation of your system. Um, but I think that because, I mean, when you're talking about stem cells, it's just, it's a little bit more complicated. So uh, I think for us it was like, do we just, put everything into it and s represent everything by a neural network or do we spend three or four months trying to come up with a model a priori that even captures a fraction of the system? It, is, it just wasn't worth our, our time and effort because the neural network would, would do the same and do it a lot quicker and with less resources. Um, but definitely uh, always starting with any information priority that speeds up the learning. And so there are, um, a lot of field physics informed machine learning um, is a new hot topic in which people are, are start with certain types of PDEs and um, kind of already integrate the physics into it and then and then learn the parameters of those of those models. Great. I think you, you guys are trying to develop something that is very interesting. The question I have is that you're approximating many different things at the same time. For example, you know, you're looking at manipulating the ionic condition, by so, you know, determining how much salt is in there. Mm -hmm. In an actual cellular system, <laughs> the extracellular matrix is extremely complex, mm -hmm. you know, and that can change you know, whether a cancer cell can become a normal or not. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that <clears throat> when you have like studying like a monolayer, right, of different cells, and you know, in biology, you know, people have been studying uh, things on a petri dish for a long time, and then people discover that studying it that way does not approximate, you know, how all it grows at all. So, so you have to kind of start all over. That's mm -hmm. that's, that's mm -hmm. the second point. Third point is you're inserting these, um, you know, wire filaments into the cells. You know, inside the cell, first of all, is not homogeneous. 
And secondly, by inserting the cell, the wire inside the cell, how does it change the actual operation of the cells? You know, I have a lot of questions like that. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Mm. Well, you could say there's no you wire in the cell. Yeah, yeah. So directed. maybe let's maybe we could start from number three. So, so it, I, I, you know, I, I perhaps I misrep misrepresented what we do. It turns out there's actually no wire directly inside the cell. Uh, we have means of controlling what happens outside the cell, um, and it's true. You know, if I go from three to two to one, it's true. Like the extracellular matrix is extremely complex, and you also have to start from somewhere. And, and right now we know that, that ions tend to control this memory potential quite well. And it's also relatively simple for us to control them. And so that's where we start from. And, uh, and uh, I'll let Marcel answer number two. But I guess just for that is that like, you know, usually I say I never like to have conclusions in my talks because if I have conclusions, I'm yeah. out of a job. <laughs> um, and so it, it's, uh, it's always good that we have like, you know, we start from something, we have more things to work later. So. So I, I, one thing we didn't mention is this is all uh, in microfluidics. So then we're able to very carefully control the environment. And so in, in one sense, yeah, it doesn't represent the natural world, but it allows us, allows us to isolate a lot of the variables that might be affecting the system response that we are unaware of. And so that we can get a, a true mapping of you know, changes in external environment to the response. That's solely a factor of that change and not other things that we are not in our control. And I'm sure Mircea wants to add to a monolayer yeah. I can add uh, because question the, because the same thing we are doing with the brain, so people can uh, have monolayers of neurons. You just understand how two neurons are firing and you stop there. But if you want to understand how they really work together, you have to create a three-dimensional body which has uh, columns and neurons. And so the same thing here. So yes, at this point we are in baby steps. Uh, which we prove at a uh, super scientific level that this actually is going to work. I'm very optimistic. <laughs> uh, so this is going to work, but this is a, a, a one layer, and from there going to someone's uh, wound blast. That's in about four years. Let's meet again in four years, and we'll tell them, uh, tell you at that point how it worked. Okay, but there are intermediate steps which we are going to probably do exactly what we did with the brains. We are creating three-dimensional uh, culture of cells, which we try to understand how they work together. And it's much closer to uh, reality than uh, the one that... Uh, so yes, we totally thought that, and you are absolutely right, this is where science goes. Uh, question. question. There's one there. Question. There's also... So I don't know what happened to the microphone. We'll not forget so, yeah. about you. Okay. So ve very early in the talk, you, you spoke about a Band-Aid. Huh? And, and I'm not sure whether that was just meant to be a metaphor or hinting at an application, and I'm curious if you can expand on that. Well, uh, yes, it's, ha uh, it's both. Uh, in some ways, uh, it's a metaphor, be uh, because uh, we all know the Band-Aid is stuck on a wound. Uh, but it is not going to be exactly like a Band-Aid, but something which is stuck on a wound. <laughs> Uh, so we imagine that uh, you imagine that will be some sort of attachment which you are uh, sticking to uh, a possible wound or uh, you are uh, in, in such a way that facilitate the interactions between the electronics and the mm, human body. It's not in the r r way that it's stuck with glue and uh, uh, has antibiotic in the middle, but in the way that uh, physically comes close to a human body, for example. The, the real shape is another question because materials and uh, techniques are developing so fast these days that that's a question with a battery and uh, my answer back to Marco that we try to create devices which are because we believe that everything can be done these days in a very, very uh, small um, shape factor. So it might not look like a real band-aid but you are still sticking it on a wound, like a dressing. So, so perhaps to summarize, like, you know, it, the application of regeneration can be many, right? One is yeah. organs, the other one can be damaged tissue, uh, and one could be wounds. Uh, we, we cannot tell you more about wounds. Uh, no. Actually, Mircea was not supposed to talk about wounds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, no, but, but it's, just it's, one it's definitely of one of the very many applications uh, that we're working on. And the idea is that every time tissue gets damaged or you need new tissue, then there's a regeneration that happens, and that's what we're looking at, broadly speaking. <laughs> you have a question over there. Be the last question. Yeah, sure. This is more of a comment that I'm just bouncing off of you. I mean, it sounds like you're doing very basic, basic research 
on how these cell membranes react to manipulating the charge in the external environment. So you really don't know where it's going to take you, and you have some ideas about applications, but if you look at the history of science, you have no idea where this knowledge is gonna lead, because it could lead in directions that we can't even dream of now. So, I mean, that's, you know, you do have these ideas about where it's going, but you really don't know. Yeah, it's the nature of academia. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> We also try to apply it. So yes, we are trying to look at a very basic uh, science, but the goal is always, so we are an engineering school at the end of the day. My students want to end up in industry, many of them, some of them in academia. Uh, so yes, because we are a university, we want to understand the phenomena very deeply. We have the uh, time for that. But on the other hand, we do want to address real problem in the world, not only to live with the phenomena. So yes, so we are working both ends. We have a huge team of uh, in, uh, enthusiastic students behind us. And uh, I think they are the power. We are just here okay. to represent them. I think, I think that's probably the best way to end this lecture. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, Thank you. see you again. <laughs>